Hello guys, welcome to another episode of the INFP Scientist. Today we'll be talking about neuroplasticity, aka brain plasticity. So this is a subject that's in neuroscience, biology, and what I'm going to do is I'll define a couple things, then I'll show you guys my famous diagrams and we'll get into it. So neuroplasticity is basically just a large blanket term for two different kinds of plasticity. The first is synaptic plasticity and the second is non-synaptic plasticity. So first of all, to understand what a synapse is, I should probably show you some diagrams so that you can understand a little bit more about neuroscience if you haven't had any training in it beforehand. So this here is my first diagram and this represents a neuron. A neuron is also known as a nerve cell or in this case specifically it's a brain cell. So what you have here is the soma or the cell body which includes the nucleus and you have these little projections coming off of it called the dendrites. Now the dendrites are going to become important in a moment because it's a way that the cells are able to communicate with each other. The cell itself also has this long process known as an axon and these myelin sheaths which are a way of keeping the conductivity going. The conductivity is essential, it's related to ion channels, to electricity and it's the actual way that the cells are communicating with each other. At the end of the axon, you're going to get this little place called a synapse, and this is where the axon interacts with the dendrites, which are this section, of the next cell. And so they're going to all kind of line up and they're going to form this connection together and communicate with each other. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to zoom in on the synapse section here. I'm going to enlarge this for you so you'll be able to see what's going on and I can explain the process in a bit more depth. So here is a depiction of a synapse, so just to kind of uh, get you guys familiar with what we're looking at here, is you're going to have the axon ending here, which we had in the previous picture, and here is going to be a depiction of the next, the next cell that we have over. So this is known as the presynaptic neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. Pretty fancy terms, but it just basically means the first cell and the second cell. Now the thing you need to know about these cells is they don't interact in a physical way, they actually interact through electrical currents. So they don't actually touch each other. In between you're going to have this area known as the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft, and this is where the interaction is occurring between these. So I'm going to explain to you guys how the information is relayed between the two different um, cells here. So what happens is the first cell is going to reach something called an action potential if it gets enough energy to do so. And an action potential is basically a threshold that needs to be used related to the um, membrane potentials. And it's going to reach a threshold where it's going to be able to communicate with the next cell. So when this action potential is reached in this cell, what happens is these tiny things here called vesicles are going to go and they're going to make their way to the edge of the cell they're going to release neurotransmitter that's going to arrive right here in the synaptic cleft and some of it is going to actually bind to the receptor sites in the next cell and then an action potential is going to be reached in this cell here and it's going to continue from there along the different cells and that's the way that they communicate so not through direct physical contact but through these different um, the ions that are traveling and relaying this message basically. So that's to do with sodium channels and it's this whole other thing that we're not going to get into for the purposes of today's lecture. So to kind of explain what happens is after the neurotransmitter is released, if it does not bind here, it's going to end up in the cleft and it's either going to be degraded or it's going to be taken back up into the vesicles where this can continue and um, it will go on with the next cycle of the action potential propagation. So just to kind of make this um, a little more apparent for you guys in the context of mental health, I'm sure many of you have heard of SSRIs or maybe you're taking them yourself for antidepressants. Um, and SSRIs are basically selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So this actually makes perfect sense in this example and I'll explain what that means. So let's say your neurotransmitter that's being released into the synaptic cleft is serotonin. What these reuptake inhibitors do is they do not allow the serotonin to travel back into the presynaptic cell. They don't allow them to go back into these vesicles here. Instead, they kind of force them into this space here so they'll have more chance to interact with the receptors, thus propagating 
this whole mechanism and allowing you to take in more serotonin and ultimately feel less depressed and happier. So that's a direct example of uh, its application to mental health. So now I'm going to, um, done with the diagrams, I'm going to go a little bit more into depth what it means, this neuroplasticity. So what neuroplasticity is, are changes in neural pathways and synapses, which I just showed you guys, which can be caused by changes in behavior, environment, neural processes, thinking, emotions, and bodily injury. So this is really important because a lot of people think, I can't change my brain. You see all these different you know, commercials about um, neuroplasticity and saying with the science of neuroplasticity, you can change your brain. Well, I'm here to tell you that a lot of things can make changes in your brain. So it's not something that's revolutionary. Things such as changes in your environment, like I said, your emotions, in depression, oftentimes you can get these ruminating thoughts where you have the same neuronal activity over and over again that kind of carved out the section in your brain that your brain just keeps going back to and re-exploring. But you can change that through mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy and certain targeted approaches can actually help you rewire things in your brain. So the brain it's also the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neuronal uh, connections throughout your life. So this isn't something that just happens at the beginning. They used to think that you had this critical window, so to say, at the beginning where you're developing, and then your brain becomes static and you can't change anything more. But that's not true. Throughout your life, there are these changes. Your brain is very dynamic and you're gonna have these changes throughout your life. So axons actually have the ability to sprout new nerve endings in the case of injury and damage, or also they can sprout new nerve endings in the case of just uh, achieving a particular function. So it doesn't have to be injury. If they just need to compensate for, let's say, deafness in the ears or for blindness, your brain will adapt itself in those situations as well. So to do this, the neurons itself need to be stimulated through activity. So if you want to get rid of ruminating thoughts from depression, you have to kind of rewire your brain in that way, which is possible to adapt to more positive thinking patterns, which is actually something I've be, been able to do on my own over time. And it's something that takes work. We're in a society where people don't want to put in that effort. So they go and they take the pills, which like I showed you, SSRIs will most likely alter things in your brain, but since you have this large influx of serotonin, you can also get a lot of side effects potentially because your body's not used to this extra amount of neurotransmitter in the brain. But anyways, the last thing I'm going to explain to you guys is the difference between synaptic and non-synaptic plasticity since neuroplasticity basically encompasses both of these things. So what synaptic plasticity itself is, the strength of the connection between two neurons based on the amount of neurotransmitter that is both released by the presynaptic cell and the re response of the postsynaptic cell to this neurotransmitter. And then what non-synaptic plasticity is, is the modification of neuronal excitability. That means basically its response to um, the ions in the system. Um, in axons, dendrites, and soma, of an individual neuron. So this is irrespective of the synapse. This has to do with just the, the cell itself. So anyways, guys, this was, um, neuroscience can be very complicated. I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of a basic review of it and explain a little bit about this to show you that you can make changes in your brain. It's actually not that difficult. Many things we do are making changes basically as we speak. When you learn something new, your brain adapts. Depending on what kind of major you go into in university, your brain's gonna be kind of different by the end of it as well. My, my professor just told me that in biology and that makes a lot of sense. So I hope you guys liked my lecture. Give me a thumbs up if you did and I'll see you precious gems very soon. Bye everyone.